as we're stepping into Lent in these days, uh, we have a series that we will do through the season of Lent on the Lord's Prayer and actually started on Ash Wednesday. Um, and I encourage you to go and seek that out if you want to know what was said then uh, that sort of began the process. But today, we step into the first words of the prayer with our Father. So would you join me in prayer? May the words of my mouth and the meditations of each one of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our salvation. Amen. As we step into the Lord's Prayer today, I want to remind everyone once again that this prayer is the most important prayer of our faith. Now, I. I don't think I'd get a lot of pushback from any of you or too many of you, but I think we would agree that this prayer really is a center of our life of prayer. It was given to us as a great gift, as it was given to Jesus' followers when he was asked to teach people how to pray. We will be exploring what the prayer is, what the prayer says, and what the prayer calls us to do. Remember the words Jesus says just before the prayer begins in Matthew 6, 9. Simply this, he says, pray like this. Everything that follows focuses one, and, and that includes us, focuses disciples throughout time on what is important to Jesus. So to be committed to Jesus meant to pray for and to yearn for and to live for what's in this prayer. Marcus Borg reminds us in Speaking Christian what the Lord's Prayer does not include. And there's some important parts for people of faith that aren't there in the prayer. What is missing may be really disappointing to Christians who live their lives in a heaven and hell framework. First of all, it has nothing to do with the afterlife. There is no petition asking God to take us to heaven when we die. This is not a stairway to heaven prayer. Secondly, it has nothing to do with material success. So for those who believe that we petition God to see that we prosper, an important point for those who follow the prosperity gospel, it's not here. There is nothing in this prayer about belief. It does not ask God to help us believe. For those who want to focus on the world as believers and non-believers, as true believers and heretics, as good and bad, as saints and sinners, this just doesn't help you get there. Jesus is not interested in that in this prayer. And it's not about Jesus. This is very interesting because while it lifts up Jesus' central concerns, one of the things that is centrally important to Jesus is staying focused on the real point, which is God. So stay focused on God is what Jesus is teaching us to do in our prayer. And he literally gave his life for this belief. What it is is really rich. So let's start digging in. Our Father, we begin with an intimate word for God coming from the Aramaic. It is Abba. It means dad or daddy, and many of you know this. It is the name for God that Jesus uses constantly throughout the Gospels. Whenever he is speaking about his relationship to his Father, it is Abba, he says, over and over again. It's, it's a name that young people use for their Father. If you speak Aramaic, or more likely, if you speak Hebrew, you will use this to call out to your dad. I, I love the times I've been on playgrounds or on the streets of Israel and I hear children calling to their fathers, Abba, Abba. And it, it just rolls out of their tongues because it's the word they use, Daddy, Dad. And it warms my heart. Abba is also, by the way, an expression used by students for their beloved teachers. It is family. It's a family imagery about intimacy and belonging. Using Abba to open this prayer is clearly saying that God is personal to me. And Jesus wants us to be in a personal relationship with God as we step into this prayer. God is dear and intimate, 
for anyone using this prayer. It's a part of saying we're family as we step into this. Now, some are challenged by the patriarchal nature of the opening words, naming God as Father, not Mother, or Creator, or some other name which is more universal. And I get that. I absolutely understand that. When I hear the Lord's Prayer offered, I often hear you use different words, changing the name Father. I've heard many variations on this, Creator, or Mother Father, or Mother. I mean, I've heard many ways of expressing this opening phrase. But when you change the opening, I ask you to do this. Remember not to change the intimate, beloved relationship, which is what Jesus is talking about here, what Jesus is calling us to, a personal relationship. So whatever word you choose, make it as intimate, as personal as possible. My cousin, Reverend Dave Long Higgins, replaces the name of God quite often in his prayers and poetry with love. So God is love, so he speaks of God as love. Our love who art in heaven. Whatever it is, keep it personal and intimate and close to your heart. Who art in heaven immediately takes us from this intimate Abba of the playground, the family, the closeness that we have on the ground to the vastness of heaven. It pulls us from the personal to the cosmic. It literally moves us from earth to heaven. And heaven is a good place to imagine God to be. We all get swept away by Walter Chambers Smith's hymn, Immortal Invisible. You know the words, immortal, invisible, God only wise, in light and accessible, hid from our eyes, most blessed, most glorious, the ancient of days, almighty, victorious, thy great name we praise. I thought you were going to finish it for me, so that's why I paused. But Jesus has been working on this intimate, intimate relationship with Abba, and now is speaking of God as unresting, unhasting, and silent as light. For all of us seeking the personal relationship with Abba, it may seem like a mixed message. Are you close to me, or are you in heaven? In his book, Our Father Who Aren't in Heaven, our member and friend, Bob Turner, Reverend Bob Turner, who shared his teaching and writing with us in the Wednesday book study group last year, makes the case that God is truly in our presence. God is right here among us. We need to, in Bob's words, change God's address. Biblical scholar John Dominic Crossan makes the point in his writing on prayer, heaven's in great shape, and the problem is that earth is not. So earth is the problem with the problems, right? Or as I like to say, we can be so heavenly minded that we become no earthly good. The challenge of changing God's address in change is changing the very meaning of Jesus's words. Uh, I don't think that's what Bob intended, but he's trying to point out the connection between heaven and earth. What if we could see the essence of our immortal, invisible God in light and accessible right here? The rest of the prayer actually ends up going there. We will be spending lots of time on earth as the prayer unfolds. But for a moment, I invite us to breathe deep the vastness, the glory, the grandeur of God. As the hymn continues, thy justice like mountains high soaring above, thy clouds which are fountains of goodness and love. Can you see God? in this vastness touching us here on earth. It is a good thing to be transfixed and changed by our God who is much bigger than our biggest problems, much deeper than the deepest part of our oceans, much vaster than our grandest dreams, much more spectacular than our greatest days on earth, and much more blessed than even our music and the poetry we have to express our love for God. It is a good thing to pray to our God in heaven, knowing that God also has a home in each of our hearts. So it is a good thing to be heavenly minded, so long as we are earthly good. Hallowed be thy name. Hallowed is a word we rarely use in our daily lexicon. I don't know that any of you 
since the 31st of October have mentioned the word to me. I mean, we hear it on Halloween, All Hallows Eve, but really, do we ever use that word? Now, some of us who are great writers might use it in certain expressions, but it's not a word we use much. It means holy, as you know. It also means saints. So both words translate from the Greek, which means the holy ones or the ones that are set apart. Paul uses this word often in his letters when referring to the saints of God. So hallowed is a derivative that is constantly used, meaning holy, right? There are at least two ways to look at this line in the Lord's Prayer, and I'll just offer them to you. Are we reminded to hallow God's name and keep it holy by being reverential to God's name, which is one thing, or is it addressed to God so that God that God's name is made holy. Since the rest of the prayer seems to address God, the latter seems more likely. But what does it mean to ask God to make God's name holy? The image of God as Father is also one of a householder of the world. And this is very important. In the first century society, which was patriarchal, the, uh, that you may be surprised by that, right? was the head of the household was always spoken of as male, right? So how does one judge whether a householder is holding the house together in a good way? How does this house run? Are the children well, t well taken care of? Does everyone have enough? Are some pampered and some neglected? Depends on where in the birth order you are, you how you answer that one. How are the animals cared for in the house? How about the building, is it in good shape? That a good householder in this expression is one that cares for the house just as God cares for the world. A well cared for world or home will set up, if you will, the next phrase, which is the kingdom coming. If it's not well cared for, it's not going to work. Again, the Lord's Prayer is a summary of what matters most to Jesus. This opening phrase that we've been in is just the beginning. When we pray the Lord's Prayer, we're praying what he was passionate about, what he was concerned about. And because we believe that Jesus is the decisive revelation of God's passion in this world, we are praying for God's dream for the world. To pray this is to be invited, to be enlisted into participation in God's passion and the passion of Jesus. We have a long way to go. The prayer's just starting. We have to pace ourselves. It's a long season. But in closing, I want to share some thoughts from one of my heroes of the faith, Dr. John Perkins. Dr. Perkins calls the Lord's Prayer the perfect prayer. He's now 91. He is like, I can't even describe John Perkins um, adequately. He's a mystic in my experience, and he, he literally is in prayer all the time. I mean, you'll be talking to him and he'll just start talking to God as though you're not there. I mean, it's the most amazing thing to watch. And he's genuine in every meaning of the word. He says he prays continuously, but it's this prayer that always brings him home to God, that centers all his faith and action. He says, the Lord's Prayer is our daily call to daily action for justice. Sometimes I'll be in church listening to the people praying the Lord's Prayer and joining them. And I'll give thanks to God that he gave us this prayer that frames our care for the hungry poor and our love for every person. A prayer that frames our care for the hungry poor and our love for all humanity, that's a keeper. Let's keep that in mind as we step next week into God's kingdom coming on earth. Amen.